Now let's talk about market, product market strategies. So one of the product market strategies is market penetration. Basically, a market penetration strategy is when we try to increase the sales of our existing products in our existing markets. So it's our current products, our strategy, when we're saying our strategy is market penetration, what we're trying to do is to increase the sales of the products that we already have on the market in existing markets. And we said, well, what are the ways we could do that? We said it's advertising, for example. So we currently have a product in the market and we sell it in the United States only. If we want to increase sales, one of the things that we could do is to spend more money on advertising. That's a reasonable assumption. If you increase your expenditures on advertising, that the sales of your products would go up. Do you agree? Yeah. That seems reasonable. What about, in terms of market penetration, what about introducing line extensions? Now that you guys know what line extensions are, is introducing a line extension a way of increasing sales of your current products? Yes, right? Because now you're going to take your existing product, the product is the same, but now you're just in introducing it in different flavors. Like Gatorade, for example. So Gatorade has lemon, a lemon flavor, they have a cherry flavor, they have an orange flavor. So each one of those we would consider to be a line extension for Gatorade. Market development is another product market strategy, <coughs> which means that we're going to increase the sales of our current products, the same ice cream, the same energy drink, Gatorade, we're going to increase the sales of those products in new markets. And what are some of the ways that we said we could do that? One of them we said was licensing. We said that's um, least risky. So if we want to increase the sales of our existing products in new markets, for our company that means going global. So that means for us selling outside of the United States. So I said we already sell our product in the United States. Now we're going to sell our products in Canada, in Mexico, in Italy, in France, in Germany, in Jamaica, in Trinidad, in Barbados, in Iran. So we're going to go global. This is our market development strategy. So the question is, well, how are we going to do that? We said, well, one of the ways we could do that is through licensing, licensing our brand. Because trying to penetrate a new market is going to be very challenging for us. We don't have a sales team there. We don't have a distribution network. We don't have office space. We don't have production a production facility, we don't have a distribution center. So how are we going to sell our ice cream there? How are we going to sell shampoo? Shampoo, right? I know a lot about shampoo. How are we going to sell shampoo globally? So licensing is one way that we could get into a market. We license our brand to a company and this company presumably has a distribution network. They have a distribution center. They have a manufacturing facility. They have a sales force. But we said that's not the only way. We could also export, which means we could produce the product here in the United States and then ship it outside of the United States. There's some risk associated with that. We could lose the inventory, for example. What happens if we ship it and then 
Um, the product gets damaged on the way to market. So let's say the ship that it's on is caught in a hurricane and all the freight is destroyed. So we're going to ship $10 million worth of inventory. Another option we said is a joint venture. So partnering up with a company in the market we want to penetrate or the markets we want to penetrate and that involves us putting money into the deal. So a joint venture, we're going to have an agreement with our company and another company to produce and sell shampoo. Well, if they have the manufacturing equipment and they have the distribution network and they have the sales force, then what is it that we bring to the market? It's got to be the infusion of cash. It's certainly one thing that we would bring to, to, the, um, to the joint venture. Or we might bring some proprietary technology. We might have some sort of unique formula for the product. Maybe it's going to help your hair grow. Some people are interested in that, making their hair grow. So, a joint venture is another way that we could uh, pursue our market development strategy. And then, also foreign direct investment, FDI. What does that mean? We go there, we build a manufacturing facility. That's not an option in every market. So, in some markets, that's not an option. But certainly that's the most risky market development approach. Because now we're talking about maybe spending a billion dollars to set up a manufacturing facility and to have manufacturing equipment installed in that facility. Both built and installed. So manufacturing equipment is typically made to order, not made to stock. So they're not holding inventory on manufacturing equipment because it's very expensive. They only make the equipment when they get an order. So we'd have to place an order to make specific manufacturing equipment. We'd have to um, build a manufacturing facility. We could see this as a sequential process. Very often companies follow this as a way to penetrate a particular market. First licensing, a one step, first step to trying to learn more about the market. Then as they learn more about the market and the needs of the consumers and the market dynamics, they could move forward with exporting the product and then formulating a joint venture. And then at some point they might decide to make the investment to build a manufacturing facility. Questions about that? Another strategy, another product market strategy is new product development. New product or new offering development. So what does that mean? That means that we're going to create a new product we're going to create a new product for our existing market. So a new product for our existing market. That's new product development. What would be an example of that? What would be an example of new product development? A new product for an existing market. Yeah, it could be. So a cereal company that has that currently makes dry cereal, cold cereal, mm -hmm. um, introducing a product that's um, now you're saying is a hot cereal. I mean, more like you can actually microwave. Microwavable. What do you think, Merlin? Gatorade offering a new uh, flavor. 
So do you think that when you talk about new product development, is that an example of line <coughs> extension or is that more of a brand extension? Line extension. <laughs> All right, let's vote again. Brand extension, line extension. Who says line extension? Who says brand extension? So new product development. So if we're going to introduce a new product into an existing market. Um, going with the Gatorade, um, I think they have like these drops that you can put in your drinks or something. Mm -hmm. um, so, huh? You can actually choose some of them too. Yeah, so maybe that's a new product in the existing market because people will like high energy teams. So if we, if we follow the logic that some of you are suggesting, then is there a difference between market penetration and new product development? Is that the same? Is increasing the sale of the existing products in the existing market the same thing as new product development? Which is? It's a new offering. So what is the new offering going to be then? Something totally different. So like they offer drinks, so they would offer the food. Yeah, for drinks. Okay, so um, like a uh, power bar or something. Gatorade power bars. What was that? They have Gatorade power bars now? Not just them, but I'm saying that a lot of the competitors are doing that. I mean, I know, I know. I'm saying like this little droplet, like they took drops of their water. So, but if you're gonna change the form of the product. If it's going to be, instead of um, liquid, it's going to be powder, or it's, if it's going to be, instead of um, a solid, it's going to be a gel or an aerosol, right? So you think about deodorant, it could be a solid, it could be a gel, it could be an aerosol. Those are examples of line extensions. It's the same product, just we change the form of the product. Everything same thing as changing the flavor of the product. It has to be completely different, you're saying? So so a Gatorade offering candy be a trend extension? What was that? I mean, Gatorade offering candy. So Gatorade candy, would that be an example of a new product? Yes. Yeah. Well, it depends on the flavor of the same brand. Well, Gatorade candy, you don't think that's a new category? You don't think that's a new product? One is we're talking about traditionally Gatorade is known as a beverage, right? It's selling beverages. It's selling these um, rehydrating beverages, right, Tanya? But now, Jimmy is saying, well, what about if Gatorade comes out with candy? Okay, so it's already out, so they, Gatorade candy, Gatorade power bars, got it, Lance. I mean, if the, the flavors are similar to the drinks, technically it could be an extension of the product because the flavors are still the same. So but is it the same product? No. Oh, no. no. Okay. It's I mean, it depends on the type of because if they offer like we are drinking candies, that's still not part of the actual candy stuff because mm -hmm. not everybody can buy it or not everybody would buy it. So what about their energy candies? Yeah. Then. So, so that's, that's that's your own category now, not even that's the market. So it depends on how we're going to define the category. If we're going to define it very narrowly, or it's going to be very broad. So some of you are suggesting that it's very broad. That anything has to do with energy, regardless of whether it's a beverage or it's a candy or not. Beverage doesn't, doesn't compete with energy um, drinks, though. What was that? The Gatorade beverage doesn't compete with other... Right, so some of us are making the assumption, the, um, the assumption that Gatorade is an energy drink, like Red Bull. It gives you wings. <laughs> right? That's what I should have brought tonight. Red Bull. Red Bull for you guys. Yes. Red Bull. It gives you wings. It gives you wings. Well, you know, when they introduced um, Pepsi into China, you know that the way that they um, translated the Pepsi brand name, what it meant in Chinese was, because it's a phonetic translation. So when you see the, um, the Pepsi packaging, when you see Pepsi on this shelf, and you say, oh, can you read what that says? Well, yes, you could read it because what it is is it's a phonetic translation. So what it says in, tra in Chinese is Pepsi. But the thing is that in China, they don't use an alphabet. It's a group of symbols. And those symbols together form a concept. So am I right, Jimmy? Right? So it's... Kung Fu um, Chinese means happiness in Chinese. So when they introduced Pepsi, 
Um, they didn't do a linguistic search in marketing. We do a linguistic search. What that means is you want to find out what that um, brand name translates to in another language. So they didn't bother to do that, just like when they introduced the Chevy Nova into Mexico. That sounded like a good idea. You want to sell a relatively inexpensive car in Mexico. The economy was severely depressed. Makes sense. Try to sell an inexpensive car there. But the thing is that they never bothered to figure out that Nova, right, regardless of what Spanish dialect it is, Nova, basically in Spanish, means no-go. So how many Chevy no-goes do you think you're going to sell in that market? So big companies make big mistakes. So students say, oh, did that really happen? Yes, it did. And students always, when they want to defend their position, they said, well, this company did this. That doesn't mean that it's right. You know why? Because they didn't hire Brooklyn College students. I told them hire Brooklyn College students, but did they? No. They went and hired students of other colleges, and then what do you think happens? The Chevy Nova! That's what happens. That's what happens. But for Pepsi, it translated to, you ready, Connie? It translates to, we bring your ancestors back from the dead. Now, that gives, that gives all uh, entirely new meaning to the value proposition of an energy drink, right? So if you drink this, it doesn't just give you wings, right? Alessia, it doesn't just give you wings. If you drink this, it'll bring your ancestors back from the dead. I think we should go with this. We should. We should do this, right? Come out with our own energy drink. But the problem is that in that market, the Chinese people didn't think that was funny because their culture has a lot of respect for ancestry and family. And that was a major mistake on the part of Pepsi. So we need to be aware of um, the branding of our product when we um, bring it into a, into a new market. All right, so in terms of Gatorade, it depends, it depends on how we define the market. We're going to come back to that when we talk about um, the different branding strategies. So can you give, can you give an example? Yes, we're going we're gonna to come back to that when we get okay. over on that side. So diversification is when we introduce a new product into a new market. That's diversification. So a good example, remember we talked about Sears? We said Sears, what they do? They acquired Dean Witter, they acquired Discover Card, they acquired Allstate Insurance. This is a company, their, their business definition, what did we say is retail? So what is it that they do? Yeah. Right? How would we define their business? We would say that they were a retailer. Mm -hmm. That they were a retailer of apparel and other household goods. But they acquired, they diversified, and they acquired these other companies, which were in financial services, um, including insurance, credit card. That's a good example of diversification. Why? Because they were very successful in their retail business, and they had an excess amount of cash. Right? Jimmy said, well, what? You have all this cash. Well, this was a company that had an excess amount of cash. And so what they do with it? They decided they were going to diversify. That was their product market strategy. They decided we're going to diversify and extend themselves into other categories. Now, when we introduce a new product, ideally our sales are going to be incremental. That means that our expectation from introducing a new product is that if our sales last year was $100 million, that this year, after introducing new products, our sales are going to be $125 million. That means that the sales are incremental. All other things being equal. So for example, in other words, assuming that we didn't land a new big account and now we have distribution at Walmart, 
because that could be the reason our sales increased $25 million. But assuming all other things being equal, if our sales are now $125 million, then, and we would know if it's specifically coming from those new products, that would be an example of incrementality. But we touched upon this last time, and I want to make sure that we cover this now, is cannibalization. I'm not talking about Lord of the Flies, okay? I'm talking about cannibalization in marketing. So let's take a look at what that is. So with cannibalization, what that means is that with our ice cream company, let's say that last year, Last year, we sold 20,000 cartons of vanilla, 40,000 cartons of strawberry, uh, 40,000 cartons of strawberry, and 60,000 cartons of chocolate. How many cartons of ice cream did we sell? Everybody got that calculator out? <laughs> Come on, business students. Best business students ever. How much? 120,000 cartons. But then we did market research. We, did, um, we looked at some secondary research, qualitative and quantitative. We did some primary research. We did some qualitative focus groups. We did a questionnaire. We got all this research at our fingertips, and what is our conclusion? After spending $150,000 on focus groups and $125,000 on a questionnaire, we found out that there's a demand in the marketplace for a new flavor of ice cream. What flavor? Mango. Now this is what happened. So we introduced mango. And this is what happened now. We introduced mango. We sold 10,000 cartons of mango. Wow, maybe that was the right thing to do. We did all this research. We introduced a new flavor based on what consumers said. Not what we thought, but based on what the consumers told us, that there's a strong preference. The purchase intent, the purchase intent for mango, a mango flavored ice cream was very high. In fact, 89% of consumers said that they would purchase mango flavored ice cream. But then look what happened. So how many cartons of ice cream did we sell the next year? We still, we sold the same number of cartons. We sold 120,000 cartons last year, and now we introduce this new flavor, and we still only sold 120,000 cartons. So that means that there's no incrementality, right, Regina? It's, we've cannibalized our own sales. And the thinking is that if we don't cannibalize our own sales, somebody else will, a competitor will. So if we don't introduce mango, these 10,000 cartons presumably are still going to go away in our scenario. It's just that they're going to buy mango flavored ice cream from our competitor. So questions? So this would be an example of cannibalization. We cannibalize our own sales. We introduce a new flavor and we sold 10,000 cartons of that, which is great. But as a result, we sold, we're assuming that as a result, we sold 10,000 less cartons of chocolate. So now we only sold 50,000 cartons of chocolate ice cream. Yeah, Shanae? 
So it's kind of like your ethical. It's not necessarily a bad thing because you're doing it before the competitors. Absolutely. So we would argue that it's better that we cannibalize our own sales than having our competitors do that. So, so in, overall, we sold the same number of cartons of ice cream. So there's no incrementality. But even though we cannibalize our own sales, what Shanae is reminding us is that it's better that we do that, that we cannibalize our own sales, because if we don't, our competitors are going to do that. Our competitors would introduce a mango-flavored ice cream, they would beat us to market, and they would get 10,000 cartons of ice cream sold with their company. Questions? All right, let's keep going. The marketing mix, also known as the four P's, he said includes product, price, place, and promotion. So the marketing mix, those four variables, those are the controllable factors that we're going to use to craft our, our marketing plan and our marketing strategies. Questions? At the end of chapter one, there's a sample marketing plan there. I also um, uploaded a sample marketing plan to Blackboard for you. Okay, so by the end of the semester, you'll be able to add to your portfolio a 20-page marketing plan that you're going to write. You can do it! <laughs> yes, you can! Merlin, come on! Ariel! <laughs> Murphy! Hey, Murphy! Murphy's here! Come on, Murphy! Can you do a marketing plan on any company you want? No, I'm going to tell you the category and give you a background from a Harvard case study. Oh, you guys, you saw it, but you pretended you didn't see it, right? Yeah. <laughs> you saw that, he's like, oh no, he's drunk. <laughs> Too much tequila. You put the lime in the coconut. Yeah. All right. We could do it. Coach is going to be there with you. We're going to make this happen. Yes. Yes, then you're going to have a marketing plan as part of your portfolio. All right? We're going to do this thing. 